on here. I don't want to go too straight in. Let's see what's going to happen. It's going to fall in. So now we're ready to go. Okay, shields down. And then we try and take the information we get from what we know that you're breathing in and relate it to how your body has responded. What we learn from this might help the larger community. The most exciting challenge of environmental and occupational disease is that they are preventable. Removing the exposure prevents the disease. This is a tremendous opportunity. How did we get here? We had bitter experience. The period of industrialization in this country and others led to you know, large populations exposed to extraordinarily toxic levels of compounds and basically epidemics. Rather than learn from preventable epidemics, we should learn how to prevent epidemics. And I think that's where our 21st century challenge is, and that's what we should be doing and are doing. In some ways, environmental and occupational problems are like the jack-in-the-box. If you're able to keep the lid on with very good practices, then things get better, and they hurt when they pop out. I believe, as most people in the department do, that there are very important environmental determinants of your health and that uh, you know, how long you live and how healthy you are has to do with the air you breathe, the water you drink, the food you eat, the building you live in or work in. Okay. Put it on the left. Okay, it's a deal. Children in Boston 100 years ago were dying prematurely of infection and that had to do with the quality of water. In the 20s and 30s, we had a lot of exposures to silica, which is crystalline quartz, which causes silicosis and fibrosis of the lung. Air pollution research was galvanized by the Great London Fog of December 5 to 12, 1952, when 4,000 people in Greater London died uh, because of air pollution. And there was a similar event in Donora. Anyone could see that these deaths and the symptoms that people experienced were attributable to air pollution. The first woman faculty member at Harvard was Alice Hamilton, and we know her as the mother of industrial hygiene, somebody who was really concerned with workplace safety. But the postage stamp that commemorates her says social reformer. My name is Walter Kincaid. I worked until I got sick, and the doctor told me that it was silicosis. I think something should be done for our wives and family as we are gone. When I work with guys, I tell them, wear the respirator, wear your respirator. Really, because welding, I'll tell you, the smoke and all grinding stuff, it's not good for you. Really affect you later on. Now we're thinking about outcomes that we really haven't thought about before. And they are more subtle. They're harder to measure. So, for example, in relation to air pollution, we started off by just worrying about lungs and how they responded. And then we realized that, in fact, the, uh, the cardiovascular system is also importantly affected. And now we're still worried about food, air, water, workplace exposures, but we're looking at neurobehavioral changes. Is it possible that some toxins cause autism or lowered IQ? Another whole new area is reproductive outcomes. If you're working in a factory in China, or you're using certain consumer products in the United States, does that have an effect on sperm quantity and quality? Is there more early fetal loss? So what we're trying to do currently is look at the whole spectrum of reproduction and development, preconception all the way to delivery of a, of a baby. And we're looking at how environmental chemicals may affect all of those stages. Two years ago, we received a large grant from the Cypriot government to train scientists from Europe, Africa, and West Asia in the environment and public health, and also to help these countries to address their environmental problems. Environmental threats do not have 
frontiers. We all pollute the same air, we all pollute the same water. You know, we have a fixed amount of water on Earth, and we rely on water for many reasons. And as we have these competing uses, water and health issues can only get worse. Unless we can understand to what extent our contaminants being processed in aquatic ecosystems, by understanding that we can make the right interventions or come up with proper strategies that can protect these competing uses. I really want to go back to India. India is a huge country with a huge problem, with, with huge population. Because of the increasing industrialization, there's so much more pollution. Um, safe water is not to be found easily. It's that bad. Many times, and I think this is really uh, a matter of great pride for the department, when we need an instrument that doesn't exist, we design it, we build it. This is a really of a one-of-a-kind image. You can see the individual connective tissue structures that uh, build the lung. Our next frontier is to do live cell imaging and, and actually see these cells respond to either an environmental exposure or a, a protein that we think may be involved in some regulatory pathway. The data that we've gathered suggests that um, obesity predisposes to asthma. The primary hypothesis that we're pursuing right now is that hormones that are derived from fat circulate through the blood and impact the lung. Um, the candidate hormone that we're pursuing is a hormone called adiponectin. We just did a, a proteomic study which identified a uh, novel protein which has never been identified before. Without the human genome study, this would have been years just to get what took months to do, really even weeks to do, to clone this gene and start studying it in the test tube. And what we believe and what the research is bearing out is there's this synergistic effect between UV exposure and arsenic exposure, that in fact arsenic potentiates or makes the UV exposure larger, and this is how it causes skin cancers. And we're using genetic susceptibility to understand that. The vitality of the department comes from our junior faculty. We need to make sure that they are recognized for the contribution they're making. To me, one of the strengths of this department has always been our student body. They challenge us, they stimulate the faculty, and we are certainly moving into a new era in assessing responses at a molecular level, at a, a gene level, at a protein level, rather than at the clinical level that we had done previously. One of the things that we've been looking at is heart rate variability, and we're also looking at markers in the blood of inflammation and vascular function with this measure of arterial stiffness. I believe we're saving lives in our own way by understanding how exposures are causing health effects. I want to be healthy, and if I don't have good health, I'm not going to be able to, to provide for my family and, and, and be on a job.